can't see all the Zoom information about the participants and stuff, but because we're in full screen, but I think that's, um, that's okay. I'm hoping that the people on Zoom can actually see the screen. I think they can. Um, so we are, um, the, the event that we're doing today is part of a series of events called the Forum for Interdisciplinary Golf Heritage Studies at Stanford. There are gonna be two more events. One is on May 3rd and one is on May 17th at the same time in the same place four o'clock, um, Encina Commons, one, two, three. And this is a series that's organized by myself and Professor Trinidad Rico, who I think will join us soon. Um, and I'm just gonna introduce the speakers very quickly. I'm Nora Barakat. I'm a professor of history in, um, and I do Ottoman Empire and Middle East in the history department. And uh, we have Mohammed Khalil here with us today, who is a third year Stanford student in computer science. And we also have Ria Kale, who's a second year Stanford student in economics and history. And last but not least, um, we have David Risley, who is professor of digital humanities at NYU Abu Dhabi with us on Zoom. And he is gonna be responding to the presentation um, when we're finished. So we're each gonna talk a little bit. We're gonna talk for about 40 minutes and then David is going to respond to the presentation. Um, we do, we're on a webinar, so we also have an audience on Zoom um, who hopefully can see everything that's going on here. So um, we have a little, I just have to figure out how to advance the slides. It's recording. Yeah, that, that's how you advance the slides, guys, with the, with the uh, mouse button. Okay, so we have an agenda. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Open Gulf Project, which is what this research comes out of. Um, Rhea, and, and also our work with this um, British colonial text uh, that we call the Lorimer text for reasons I'll explain. And Rhea is gonna talk about her experiences working with the Lorimer data. Um, Mo is gonna talk about the work that we've done with handwritten text recognition, especially with printed and handwritten Arabic texts. And then I'm gonna close out talking a little bit about what I feel like digital methods give us as historians and why we should bother um, thinking about them as historians in, in Gulf history and other fields. And we'll mention very briefly at the end, um, the future projects that we're hoping to work on. So um, Open Gulf is a research group that was founded in 2018 at NYU Abu Dhabi, which is where I was before I joined the Stanford faculty in um, 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. I'm just gonna move this so you guys can see uh, the screen a little bit better. Um, and what, so David and I founded this, um, this research group in Abu Dhabi and what we were trying to do was create a space where um, different researchers interested in Gulf studies really all over the place could, um, could think about using digital methods for their, for their research. And Gulf studies is really more and more I'm recognizing a burgeoning field. Um, we're doing, you know, this, this series is really trying to highlight that. Um, but it hasn't done, there haven't been a whole lot of scholars working with digital methods in this field. So since then, since 2018, Open Golf has become this umbrella for a number of projects, and two of them have become very active at Stanford. So when I joined the Stanford faculty, the group also became affiliated with the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis um, here at Stanford. And we have two projects that are running. One involves maps and analyses that are based on a British geographical gazetteer from the early 20th century. Um, and the other involves creating models for automatic transcription of handwritten Arabic texts that were also produced in the Gulf in the 19th and 20th centuries. And these are sort of examples of those that you see on the screen, and I'll talk about um, them in a bit more detail in a minute. But the theme that we really want to emphasize in the presentation is kind of the colonial legacies, both of the archival situation in the Gulf, which kind of shapes which texts we end up working with and which texts we're able to work with, and also the methods that we have at our disposal for digital engaging with these texts, right? And how we, so the presentation is also thinking about how we engage those colonial legacies as historians working with digital methods, right? Like how we should, um, should think about them and work with them in our research. So I'm gonna start by introducing the project that Ria has been working on, um, which is mapping Lorimer's Gazetteer of the Persian Gulf, Central Arabia and Oman. This is, this is an image of the, the text. It's a five volume historical and geographical gazetteer about the Gulf region as the British defined it in the early 20th century. Um, there's a big question about why we chose to start with this text. One of the things that we started doing with Open Gulf is, is thinking about which historical texts were available online in digital forms 
questions and which texts we could involve students in analyzing, right? Um, and this takes us into just a brief note on the archival situation in the Gulf. So state archives in the Gulf region have focused mostly on collecting material from other imperial archives. Um, other imperial archives on a global level, right? So Ottoman archives, British archives, Portuguese archives, et cetera, collecting material about the Gulf from those archives. They haven't focused as much on making publicly available, locally produced, for example, private collections. Um, and this is that situation is to some extent um, reproduced online. So the most well-funded digital archiving, like you know, royally sponsored project in the Gulf is the Qatar Digital Library. And the Qatar Digital Library has an agreement with the British Library and they basically publish um, most of what the British Library holds that has to do with the Gulf, which is a voluminous amount of material Material. They publish it, um, you know, very high quality, downloadable, open, openly available um, digital images, which are, which is, you know, been a big resource for us in this project. But they're all British colonial um, sources. And so part of our decision to start with this British Gazetteer was about its availability. This Gazetteer is available in PDF form on archive.org. Um, Brill also has a digitized edition. It was something that we could very easily um, create text files out of through an OCR process, an optical character recognition process. Also because it's in English and most of the OCR, OCR software that is out there works best in English or at least Latin based languages. So this was um, Latin alphabet languages. So these were some of the you know, basic reasons that we decided to start with a text like this. The other reason is that this is an iconic text for historians working on the Gulf, right? Like it's, um, it's a text that many historians use as a resource. They'll want to know about a particular community or particular town or village, and they'll open it up and and um, for it, it's almost like a dictionary or, a, you know, a, a encyclopedic reference. And so we were interested in thinking about what kinds of analyses, digital analyses, we could do with a text like this that has like a lot of tabular data, a lot of information about like how many camels and huts and people in various communities there were. Um, and so, yeah, coming at it from a sort of more deconstructive perspective rather than using it as a reference through using digital methods. Um, I'll say something before Ria talks about her work with this on the workflow that we developed with um, the Lorimer text. So the first thing that we could do once we had these text files, make, making text files from the geographical, the, the Gazetteer has geographical and historical sections. It has about 800 geographical entries about all different kinds of things. And we um, spent about a semester creating text files from that PDF um, uh, version. And then once we had the text files, we could put them into this platform called Recogito. Recogito is a platform that you can use to annotate people and places in the text. So you basically go in and highlight the people and the places. And when the idea with Recogito is that when you highlight something and then identify it as a place, the platform will automatically link it to geographical coordinates. And then you can make a map um, of all the places in the text fairly easily. Um, We'll talk in a minute about why that process was not as smooth as we expected it to be with, um, with this text, even though it's English, even though it's digitally available, but that's, um, that is the idea. And then after you've gone through and annotated the entire text, you get what's in the middle, which is you can export um, the information that you've annotated into a Google sheet or any kind of spreadsheet. And then from that spreadsheet, you can visualize it into, um, into a map. So you know, the, the annotations um, took a couple of years, then we started realizing, okay, um, what we have is this data set where uh, the data is not, basically we made the data set with help from a lot of different students in Abu Dhabi who were going through and annotating these locations. They turned out to be very voluminous. The data set has about 50,000 annotations in it. And um, the other thing that we realized fairly quickly is that Recogito was not going to um, be able to, to automatically geolocate the locations in this text. Why? First of all, the spellings are different than what Recogito expects because it's an early 20th century text and it has all sorts of um, interesting spellings or different kinds of spellings of Arabic place names or Arabic, Persian, um, sometimes Turkish place names. And the other reason is because Recogito's, the way that it works, it focuses on places that have a particular population level and above, right? So many of the places that this, um, this gazetteer is mentioning, some of them no longer exist. Many of them are very small, like they're villages or they're a well somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula. So 
the students ended up having to do quite a bit of manual work, looking for these places and then entering um, information about them that we could then link to geographical coordinates. So what we um, got Rhea involved in um, is this process of cleaning up that data so that we can eventually um, uh, so that we can eventually publish it. So here you see, um, I don't know how well you can see in the audience, but the purple points are the places that Recogito, the platform was actually able to automatically verify. And you can see that they're concentrated in the coastal areas of the Gulf and in what's now Iraq. And also there's, uh, there's you know, many points mentioned um, in the text that are also in the Eastern Mediterranean and Egypt. The orange are the ones that we manually identified. And you can see there's quite a bit more orange. Um, and this is not complete because we're still in the process of cleaning up that data. What we have been able to do with the Laura Margazetir that we've been sort of more immediately successful with is create maps um, of particular elements of the text, right? Like the one in the middle is a map of all of the mentions of camels in the Gazetteer, right? So you can go through and pull out particular, um, you know, uh, like I said, villages, towns, different animals, different flora, different Different, you know, different kinds of flora and fauna, and then connect them to locations. And that has been much more easily, you know, completable because the locations are much less than 50,000 trying to figure out the entire text. And then the one on the right is a map that David made using one of the indices in the Lorimer text that is about um, which purling boats were flying which protection flags. So some of them had Turkish Ottoman um, uh, flags that they were flying. Many of them had British, some of them had Persian. And so through the Lorimer, you know, the, the data that we have there, we can create these kinds of visualizations and see what's going on in the Gazetteer. I didn't say from the beginning, I mean, this text is also important because this Gazetteer genre is really iconic as a British form of knowledge production, right? It was also happening in India. It's really started in India and then moved to the Gulf. So there are very, very detailed gazetteers about um, uh, the Indian subcontinent that this kind of builds off of. But again, even historians of South Asia haven't really dug into the data that these can provide in this kind of a way, in this kind of a deconstructive fashion. So that's also one of the things we're trying to do. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Ria. We're going to just move because we have the zoom on the screen here. Try not to trip over the screen. Uh, so as described, what I've been working on has been the process of cleaning the data. Um, so the process of annotation has been ongoing for the past few years with a lot of different annotators finding geographical coordinates for different toponyms. And um, right now cleaning the data entails uh, reviewing the annotations and verifying them by comparing the geographical coordinates with descriptions from the Lorimer text. And for this, GeoNames has been a really effective tool because it not only allows us to standardize all the coordinates, but it also allows us to use an easier interface with the maps to describe, um, to compare with the descriptions from the Lorimer text. And then if you look at the image on the right, that's just an excerpt from the Google Sheets with the data and going through all the GeoNames, often with multiple alternatives provided for each uh, location, and then deciding which geoname best represents that specific place. And then um, just to zoom into one aspect that came up when cleaning the data has been considering the nature of colonial knowledge production, because of course with the Lorimer text, a lot of this is the British perspective of Middle Eastern locations, but that also tells us a lot about their perception of power and ownership of land and so on. So if we look back to the image on the right, that's um, Abu Dhabi. So as you can see, there are a lot of mentions of Abu Dhabi throughout the Lorimer text. And um, these locations often have different characteristics and therefore different geographical coordinates. So one key issue there has been whether that is defined as a populated place referring to where people live or an administrative division. And then that tells us a lot about the British conception of a sheikh's power. So a lot of the discussions we've had when cleaning the data has been to consider what was meant by the text and therefore what geo name would be most adequate for it, which will then of course help with the maps that we saw on the previous slide. Um, and then just a, a few kind of quick reflections on how the Open Gulf project relates to the UAE's history, because that has definitely been 
the key point, the drawing point for me. The reason I joined this project is because I've always wanted to study Middle Eastern history here, having grown up in Dubai. And um, I found that especially going to a British school in Dubai, the teaching of Gulf history is very different and often very limited. I was immediately struck by more so the pedagogical utility of the Open Gulf project, because for me in high school, it was definitely broad strokes of generalizations that describe the history of the UAE. And then seeing kind of just something as simple as these maps already show us so much more that can be shared at a high school level as well. And that to me is really important because I left my high school not knowing that much about Gulf history just by growing up there, which didn't quite seem to sit right with me. Um, and Open Gulf really allows you to have this specificity and that specificity is usually only reserved for British history, especially at a high school level. Um, so I felt that that was a really important text in teaching us more about Gulf history, but also the way in which we're using digital humanity to understand and share this data is really important to me. Um, and then I suppose the second part is it also really reveals the disparate nature of development in Dubai. And I think this is something I came across when cleaning the data and often some locations completely had disappeared and there was no trace of them left, whereas others remained spots in the desert, often camping spots, if at all. And this emphasizes the geographical disparity of development in the UAE, which is another area of study that is underrepresented in many ways. Um, so all in all, I felt that the Open Gulf Project has been really important for what it reveals about the UAE's history, which is kind of my focus when I came into it and my focus on the Trucial States. Um, and then, as you can see, there's just a quick image of kind of the most common development in UAE, but it often is just that and nothing more to it, whereas Open Gulf helps add color to kind of the reality of how Dubai and the UAE has changed. And then for the next one, I'd just like to pass it on to Mo to discuss the other aspect of the project. Okay, awesome. Um, so I joined the project around a year and a half ago. And when I first joined, um, the sense I got from Nora and David was that although the Lorimer had given them a lot of information to work with, there were certain limit limitations to only using a single British text when mapping out the Gulf and examining the history of the Gulf. And so I think they were both looking forward to looking at other sources that we could look at, especially sources that weren't written by the British or by other colonial forces that had been in the Gulf before. And the issue with that is that sources on the Gulf that aren't written by the British are insanely rare. And that's even compared to other countries in the Middle East or North Africa. Um, there are almost no sources that are written about the Gulf that are just publicly available. And even harder is to find sources that are digitized that we can do what we did with the Lorimer with. So just highlight and then annotate. And what that meant was we had to look at other places. And the best way to do that was to look at either handwritten or typed texts. And the reason for that is that the area, the period of time that we were looking at was the 19th, late 19th and early 20th century when most texts were transitioning between handwritten texts for certain like letters and correspondences or typed texts if it came to like um, more formal, um, just like records and things like that. And so what that meant was that we had to figure out a way of digitizing these texts. and a simple way to do that would be to just transcribe every single text, but that's not feasible if you want to do it on a larger scale. And so what we thought of doing was developing um, a machine learning model that could um, transcribe, that could automatically transcribe texts, um, both handwritten texts and type texts. And so the texts that we first started with were type texts. Um, so for example, you can see here the Hadari text on the left is a type text, and that's the first one that we started with. Um, as Nora said, we were using Transcribus, which was a handwritten text recognition um, software that you can use to create handwritten text recognition models. Um, and we were seeing if it would work on type text. Um, and it actually really did. We ended up with an error rate of 8% after only transcribing, I think it was around 60 or 70 pages, which is pretty surprising considering um, the fact that there isn't already a model like this. But there actually is, because if you look at Google Translate and you open your phone, you can just scan Arabic type text and it's going to work. And so that was one of the things, that was one of the walls that we hit was that as much work as we do on this one project, there's always going to be better models that can transcribe type text for Arabic because there's just such a large source of data that like these big companies have like Google, for example. However, what we found was that there wasn't 
any really good model for handwritten for handwritten text in Arabic. And so I think that was the next step that we decided to take was to start, start transcribing Arabic text that was handwritten and create a handwritten model. And the ones that we started with were the Ajaji letters that are um, on the right of the screen right here. Um, another thing that also that, that also meant was that I think using type texts also takes us back to the problem that we had in the first place, which is that especially in the late 19th century and early, early 20th century, a lot of these type texts were also texts that came from very powerful people because most people weren't able to type text. And so if you wanted to get a real full picture of what was happening in the area at the time, kind of like the geographical intricacies of the area, we had to start looking at handwritten texts. And by that, we mean like letters, um, correspondences, and just journals that people have kept about the area. And so that's why we decided to start working on handwritten texts. And that's most of what we've been working on recently. Um, so this is the general workflow that we were following. And Nora kind of talked about this a bit earlier. Um, but there are three main stages to what we're doing. The first one is this text preparation text preparation stage, um, which is through Transcribus, and that's what um, that's what we've been using to create the model that we're using. And the nice thing about this is we're kind of, I guess, like going at two things at the same time. On one hand, we're creating a model for handwritten text, but also at the same time by transcribing these texts, which we found from various sources, whether it's the QDL, Qatar kind of Digital Library, or other sources. Um, these texts can also be used to map um, for mapping and for creating these visualizations that we'll be talking about more later. And so it was kind of the perfect balance of, on one hand, we're working on this model that we want to advance, but also on the other hand, these are useful in the moment and we can use these in the moment to kind of examine this further. The next step in the workflow that we looked at was um, Rekikido, and that's the annotation part of the workflow, um, which Nora also kind of talked about a bit. Um, and how this worked was that we would let Transcribus, like the goal is to let Transcribus auto -trans transcribe these texts. Uh, right now, we've what we're doing is we'll transcribe the text and then there'll be some errors. So we'll have to go in and manually fix the errors, but we're definitely reaching a point where we're gonna be able to have Transcribus do everything for us. And once we start annotating, um, we do what Rhea and Nora were just talking about and end up with visualizations like this one right here, um, which we can end up posting on the Open Gulf website and can be open source. Uh, sources of information for people who are interested in the area. Now, obviously, there were a lot of challenges with Transcribus, and um, right now here, what's on the slide is just the general challenges, but I think what's more interesting is to look at the challenges when it came to the two different types of text, whether it was handwritten or type text, because although they were very similar, there were some very slight variations between the two that are very interesting for, for the study. Um, so starting with Transcribus, which is the transcription software, um, I think an issue with that is that we were just saying there's such limited data on, um, there's such limited data, there's such limited transcribed Arabic text that most of the models that we create end up overfitting to the text that already, to the transcriptions that we already have. Um, and an issue with that, especially with type text, is that because Transcribus is a handwritten text recognition software, that means that when we run it on type text, it tends to overfit more. And to explain that, um, so if any of you have worked with uh, machine learning models before, especially the ones that ones that kind of have to do with computer vision, how it works is based on what the model, how the model is meant to, like what the model is meant to do. Um, there's a certain percent of probability where it allows for some error in within that percentage. And what that means is, for example, if you have type text and you have, you're writing a model, you're writing software that's supposed to create a model for type text that percent of difference isn't going to be as much as handwritten text because with type text, it's way more uniform. You get the same letter every time because you're typing it the same every time. Whereas with handwritten text, you have more of a spectrum. And what that means is if you have the same letter spelled slightly differently, it still accounts for that because that, there's that percentage of error that it accounts for. The issue is that because Transcribus is a handwritten text recognition software and we were using type text to start with, um, what that meant was because we were using for example, say we use two different fonts of two different type texts, it ends up with two distinct points of it's either this or either this for this letter. Whereas what Transcribus expects is more of a spectrum between the two. And so what that means is you end up overfitting to either one of them or to the other rather than accepting the fact that there's a spectrum. So for example, um, you can see here um, that, so even if you don't speak Arabic, that last comma at the end um, was transcribed as a closed parenthesis. And the reason for that was because the, this was a type of text and the other type of text that we also used was from newspapers. And in the newspaper one, um, the commas were way smaller 
whereas in this one, they were way bigger. And so once we moved to this one, every time it would see a comma, it would assume that it was a close parenthesis because it was bigger than what it assumed a comma would be. Whereas if it was handwritten, it would see there was a spectrum of different sizes of commas. And so it would understand that this would still be a comma. And so that's why another reason why I think with transcribus, even though it's harder to train it on handwritten texts, um, it doesn't reach the same plateau that it would with type text because there's a certain point with type text where just having these distinct points makes it hard to kind of cover the whole spectrum of possibilities of what the letter could be. The next thing that we want to the, the sorry, the next um, software that we're going to look at is Recogito, and that's the one that's used for annotation. And another challenge with this one, um, and this one is also kind of specific to Arabic rather than Latin languages, is that with Latin languages, a lot of times um, there is, the, if you have a prefix or a suffix, for example, El Basra right there, the El is a separate word from Basra, whereas in Arabic, they're connected together. And so if you were to, for example, highlight the word Basra or highlight the word El Basra, it's going to find every instance of that word, but it won't find the instances of the word that don't include the prefix or don't include the suffix or whatever. And what that means is that you end up missing out on a lot of words that should be automatically, automatically recognized by the software. Um, and then the second thing that we also reached was, again, the same problem that we've been facing for pretty much the entire project, which is not enough data in Arabic and especially spelling data. And this becomes even worse when you start looking at handwritten texts, because with just by the nature of type text, people are going to use more formal language and they're going to use more, um, they're going to use more like uniform spellings. Whereas if it's handwritten, people are more likely to use certain dialects or certain um, different spellings of a word. And so again, we end up with a lot of issues there where a certain place might be spelled five different ways. And so we'll recognize it at five different spots and then find out that it's actually the same place and it has the same coordinates. Um, but yeah, so pretty much overall, I think the biggest issue we found um, is just the lack of avail available data and prior work done. And luckily for us, that means that everything else kind of seems to work. Um, we do have like the fact that we have a handwritten text recognition model and a type text recognition model is almost a proof of concept that this could work with more data and all we need is just additional data and more work in the area. So yeah, that's all. I'll pass it back to Nora. Um, thank you. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes before we pass it to David for response to talk about a few of our more historical findings um, and sort of why this, uh, I, I like to try to articulate why I think these methods and how this project is sort of changing the way that I approach historical texts and the way that other historians might approach them as well. Um, so one of the things this project has me thinking about, especially the, the process of branching out from British texts that Mo was describing, is kind of a more nuanced history of um, what I would term layered sovereignty in the 19th century Arabian Peninsula. So here we have two maps of the 19th century Arabian Peninsula. Um, I'll try to explain them. The one on the right is not super easy to see, but I'll, I'll tell you why um, I find it interesting. The one on the left is a pretty standard map that you find in, if you just Google like 19th century Arabian Peninsula. Um, it's part of, it, this is the region of Nejd and what's green um, represents something that um, historians across, uh, you know, global historians really have called the second Saudi state. Um, but this is part of a Saudi narrative of state building that says that Nejd was under this solid colored Saudi sovereignty in the middle of the 19th century. The Ottoman map on the right, this is a, actually a map of Ottoman roads. Um, and so it doesn't, I like this map because it doesn't have any solid colors. Like it's not sort of um, claiming sort of monochrome sovereignty across any particular space. Instead it's roads. But what's very like typical about this map in the Ottoman mapping universe is that it uses, um, I, I know that people on the screen can't, can't see me anymore, but I'm just pointing to the bottom right part of the map. It uses the region of the Arabian Peninsula for sort of the Ottoman version of metadata, right? Like the description of what the map is about, meaning there's nothing really there that they want to represent. It's just blank space where they can put the description of what the map is about, right? There were no roads there that they wanted to represent. Um, you know, it's it's sort of empty space on the map. And what the one of the texts that we first started working with and trying to make um, machine readable, trying to make usable with these platforms was this 19th century text um, uh, that was on one of the previous screens, the one that Mo was talking about um, 
as a as a one of the printed texts. Um, it's a chronicle of an Ottoman uh, scholar from Baghdad. His name was Ibrahim al Haidari, and he wrote this chronicle treatise. It's like a geographical political history um, in the late 1860s. And it gives us a very different perspective on sovereignty in the Arabian Peninsula in the 1860s. We chose it partly because of its form. It was, it was printed and published in the 1990s and there's an accessible PDF of the text online. So this goes back to all that stuff I was talking about in the beginning about availability. It has three chapters, one on Baghdad, one on Basra, and one on Nejd. And so it kind of outlines this geography that's focused on Iraq, where he was from, um, but really sees Iraq and the Arabian Peninsula as this cohesive, contiguous, shared space without any real um, important political borders in it. Um, and we focused in our work on this text, the annotation, once we had a text file on this one chapter on Nejd. And this chapter, this, this um, Iraqi scholar is basically using it to encourage the Ottoman government to take a much more active role in the political contestations that were going on in Nejd in the middle of the 19th century between the Saudis and a couple of other emirates. One of them was called the Rashidis and also between the Ottomans themselves. Um, and so, this map that, um, that we made from that text file and from the process of annotation shows um, a very different vision of kind of layered sovereignty in Nejd, right? Um, al Haidari presented Nejd as the space that was administered by these emirates that were subordinate to the Ottoman Empire, right? So he saw the Saudis as just sort of Ottoman vassals. Um, and this map sort of represents how he represented the, how he, how he talked about the geography. So the little circles in the middle are all villages that he named in Nejd. And then I was able to go in and geolocate. And they're different colors because he organized them into different administrative divisions that he called Nahiyas. And this Nahiya thing is significant because the Nahiya was this administrative form in, in Ottoman bureaucracy that goes back to the 15th century, but became very important in the 19th century. They were really trying to use it to create this uniform territorial sovereign space across the empire. So him sort of placing these villages, even though there was no Ottoman military presence there, there were no courts there, there was no, you know, there wasn't really much in terms of an actual Ottoman presence there. He's imagining these villages as being Ottoman administrative units. Um, and the other things on the map I can just tell you are there's these big red circles are places that al Haidari um, identified as being the borders of Nejd. And then these little red circles are places that are out that he identified as being outside. So he also has this pretty distinct vision of what this space is and, and what its borders are. And then there, I added these green circles on the right al Haidari's treatise in a way was effective because just a couple of years after it was written, the Ottoman government did come into this region, into the Arabian Peninsula with a military force trying to establish courts, et cetera. But all, the only place where they really managed to do that was on um, the Eastern coast in what's now Qatar, uh, the Eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia. So this vision of Nejd as a place full of Ottoman administrative um, uh, divisions was kind of aspirational, but it does give us a much more complicated idea of what the sovereignty situation was in the Arabian Peninsula in the 19th century than the first maps I showed of either a blank space or a solid green um, uh, second Saudi state. Um, I want to just pause and mention that there was nothing really automatic about this process of working on hydrity, right? Like, as I said before, Rekogito was not able to automatically geolocate places that are this small, these villages in the Arabian Peninsula. I had to go in and manually find each one. Um, and, but having this machine readable text, I think was important, not only for being able to work automatically or being able to work more quickly. It also sort of brought me to the text in a different way. It made me think more geographically. It made me, I don't think I would have noticed this Nahia thing if I hadn't been going through and annotating each place. And then if I wasn't able to see that there's kind of clusters of colors, right? Like the villages, he's organizing them in particularly sort of geographically um, dividable clusters. So without the visualization, without that process of annotation, I don't think I really would have come to that, um, that research conclusion. I'm gonna, I have, there's one more slide that I could talk about maybe in the Q&A, which is about borders and sovereignty between Iraq and Kuwait. And this is based on the, the handwritten text that Mo was talking about, but I think I'm gonna skip it for now and um, just say something about the future 
horizons of this project. These are, this is a collection of 19th and 20th century um, property records from Kuwait that I'm very excited about. It's available at this um, website that we could call almost like a heritage website called kuwaithistory.net. There's, there's a proliferation, proliferation of websites like this in the Gulf that are basically local historians posting um, records that they have onto the web, making them freely available. And they're also downloadable, or you can at least obtain, you know, scrape images of them. Um, and so these are property records that we could basically implement this same workflow on and then analyze in the ways that we've been analyzing. And then um, Mo and I have also been working on more uh, material from the Qatar Digital Library in Arabic. This is um, correspondence about the slave trade in Oman in the 1870s. That collection is voluminous and has a lot of um, Arabic material that we can use to add to that model that he was talking about. And then the other big future horizon in the next few years is to continue the process that Ria is working on and eventually make all of that geographical data that we've collected from Lorimer published, um, publishable so that it can be used by whoever wants to use it for pedagogical or other reasons. I think we've been going on for 35 minutes. I think we'll stop there. We're gonna pass it to David. I'm gonna stop the screen share and hopefully we'll be able to see what's going on in the webinar and we'll be able to see David on the screen and hear him in the room. Can you hear me okay? Can everybody hear David? Okay, I'm gonna just try to make it so that everybody in here can see you and see the Zoom rather than everything that's going on on my desktop. There we go. Okay. Mute here? Yeah, hear me that's okay? a good idea. Okay. Okay, hi everybody. My name is David Grizzly. I uh, teach digital humanities at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, I'm really happy to uh, see this project being presented today at Stanford um, and uh, in its online um, uh, dissemination as well. Um, I, I'd like to just say a couple things, um, kind of framing top uh, uh, comments, if you like, um, at the end um, after we've heard um, this. Uh, really exciting and wide ranging um, talk that's both about uh, historical content and archives, but also meth also methods and new methods. So um, I think that one of the reasons that this is uh, so exciting um, for the, as the title suggests of mapping the Gulf um, is that this kind of work isn't really being done uh, anywhere else, right? The, the kind of work that we're talking about here by the word mapping, uh, it's not like we're creating an atlas. We're not creating something which is a fixed um, uh, print uh, official um, account of territories uh, in the region, um, but instead um, looking at the region in a more um, variegated, more interesting, and perhaps uh, even, even one might say just more subtle way um, and the different ways that we can imagine through uh, the historical record, um, the kinds of spaces that show up um, from, um, from the Gulf. So one of the things that I think is important to say about digital scholarship in general, I don't know how much uh, uh, we have experience in working with digital scholarship, but very often digital scholarship from Western or not necessarily even Western, but from locations uh, in the world that have um, uh, centralized archives um, is that digital scholarship focuses on the transformation of um, objects, uh, texts, um, material objects even sometimes, um, and their digitization and then access for the purpose of study. And I think one of the things that you took away from the presentations today is just how difficult that is or how far we are from that scenario um, in studying the Gulf. So um, I think that because there's this expectation in digital scholarship that things are, um, are already digitized, um, but that we also have a kind of a special relationship um, in, uh, in the Open Gulf Project with um, uh, the historical record in the sense that we get to choose um, the things that we want to work on and we get to choose and, and, and focus on them um, in, in, as Nora was suggesting in the end, with a significant amount of effort and detail. And that's different because very often, if you like distant readings or kind of very large um, uh, uh, algorithmic readings of a, of a body of material can actually miss a lot 
Um, and so, whereas one of perhaps what is one of our um, weaknesses in the project, which is that we have to move through things very deliberately and very slowly, um, that also allows us to reflect on bias um, and uh, in, in the globalized digital record um, and unevenness and um, to uh, contextualize the kinds of findings that we have uh, in, I, again, to use the word in a more subtle way. So what this really means is that the work in Open Golf, I would say is an iterative process, right? It's loop-like. Um, and so we, uh, as you saw in a few of the examples, we complete one process um, and that process uh, uses some kind of platform or some kind of technology uh, to get us to one step. Um, and whereas that seems, that might seem like a very uh, laborious task, and it is, um, the, I think what we're starting to see uh, in, the, in the various elements of the project is that um, those enabling technologies, those models are allowing us to come up with some new excite and exciting results. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring uh, a point to, uh, to Nora's last slide, uh, in addition to some work that I'm doing uh, on the English material um, at the end of my comments. So the first thing that I wanna say uh, after that somewhat um, uh, long introduction is that what we're, one of the things we're doing here is we're working with in the domain of spatial history, right? Um, spatial history, um, you may know that term, it may sound familiar. It's a, in some ways, a spatial history or spatial humanities also sometimes called a branch of the digital humanities is used um, as an umbrella term uh, for people who put um, uh, geography at the center of the work that they do. Um, and so I'm gonna just read a quote from Doing Spatial History, a new volume that came out just this year. And I'm, it says, uh, this is uh, Doing Spatial History published at Rutledge, 2022. Writing spatial histories does not necessarily involve either using or making maps. Spatial history can mean working with spatial concepts to frame analysis, which is then disseminated through the dominant medium used by historians, the written text. However, thinking spatially about the past does suggest the value of maps and mapping as source, method, or output. We focus on how maps created from a variety of historical sources can play an integral role in the research process as tools of analysis. So I think the, the part of that quote, unquote, uh, finished, that's page 274 of that book, um, of one of the essays in that book, I think one of the things that's interesting to me here is about this process of maps and mapping as three things, source, method, and output. Of course, we have the ingestion of some digitized historical maps. We have some processes where we're working on extracting information from those maps. We also use across varied sources, um, geographic coordinates or unique ideas for places um, as a way of connecting the data, linking the data across the sources, um, and then creating things like these thematic or these what are sometimes called cartogramic um, visualizations that um, Nora was showing. And that, so it's both uh, input, right? Um, working, and dissemination. And so one of the things that's sort of difficult about that is that uh, the kinds of maps that one would be working with, uh, just be researching, uh, using as a, a, as a mode of thinking about one's materials are not necessarily the things that you wanna share with the, with the larger community or that make the most sense to non-specialists. And so one I think or one of our challenges here is not only working with a body of materials um, that and discovering a body of materials that's actually unknown, but then trying to communicate effectively um, to different kinds of audiences what that what those sources can tell us. Uh, I think Ray picked up on that a little bit uh, in her talk about what it can tell us about um, the, the the spaces uh, of of the Gulf um, that people like myself live in. The other thing that I'd like, the second point that I'd like to make about today's uh, talk is really kind of a classic problem that most historians have, and that's just about collecting and managing your sources. I said just a second ago that one of the things we do is in thinking about these sources spatially, that we use certain, uh, we use certain um, bits of information, or let's call them here, I called them um, geographic coordinates or uh, unique IDs. We use pieces of information that allow us to link together materials. But I think that um, one of the things that 
is it might not be a link that's obvious uh, to make um, with the material that Mo talked about, um, is that of actually collecting the sources before you even do any of that work, right? And this goes back to my point about uh, the about digital scholarship, expecting that one already has, in some ways, a prepared corpus. So um, this is where I say, you know, uh, if you if you were a historian of China or a historian of France or Latin America, you would have a national library or a set of national libraries and archives uh, that probably began digitizing materials in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and indexing them, creating metadata about them, making them discoverable. And therefore, you would be starting on the, the shoulders of the giants, so to speak, right? You're starting with all of this uh, kind of human layer, uh, labor uh, that goes into uh, historical uh, research. And I think in our case, um, and I don't mean this in a glib manner, but we're kind of flying the plane as we, uh, we're building the plane as we fly it, right? Or flying the plane as we build it. Um, and I don't mean that by that, that we're doing something dangerous or that we're doing something sloppy, but rather we have to start um, with materials that sometimes have no metadata at all or have very, very limited metadata or are found in places where um, uh, the, the act of archiving them was a very localized, very individualized effort or Alternatively, even where we have something like the Qatar Digital Library, where we have materials for which very expensive uh, in terms of human labor metadata has been created, we have no transcriptions, for example, or we have nothing but that metadata. And so we're in a, we're in a, it's a different situation to work on the Gulf in terms of digital scholarship than if you were a digital historian working in other parts of the world. But I think my third and last point is about multilinguality and about um, a variety of sources. I think that one of the things that, that the digital as a way of working provides us is it that indexing process of connecting different materials based on common recurring themes or common recurring places or people um, is actually a very powerful way of bringing together archives uh, bringing together a disparate archive. Now, the Qatar Digital Library has understood this, right, in the sense that they know that uh, assembling a body of materials to work on the Gulf means bringing materials from India, bringing materials from, uh, as Nora said, Portugal or from Turkey or from other places in digitized format in one place. But what's really required for it to be a historian working on those materials is the glue, it's the, it's the, the pieces, the indexing parts that allow us to make connections in and across materials. Now, I think one of the things that we're, what we're finding is as we start to do that more and more, is that we're finding that the source material from the region is actually interested in similar things. And I say this across languages and across different traditions. So things like environmental data, we saw the map of the camels, right? But we also um, have much, many, lots of information. And the, Brit the British were very, very good at this um, in Larmor. We have things like crops, lots and lots of material about crops or about temperature ranges, things like currencies and transactions. Um, uh, we saw the map of the purling boats and the flag that they, uh, protection flag that they flew, but also weapons and the, the circulation of weapons in that environment. So. We're, we're at a point now in Open Gulf where I don't think that our comparative work or looking at these different themes or these different categories across the various material is fully intentional and fully designed because we don't in some ways actually know everything which is there. But we're beginning to build building blocks that allow us to make um, very, very evocative um, comparisons between and across the material um, that we're finding. The last thing that I want to say about the project, which I think is really important, that not ever, that was sort of mentioned in uh, in passing, is that the term "open golf" is actually intentional, right? The word "open" is really important here, and "open" um, to me in this particular case doesn't just mean that we publish open resources, although that is part of the project, right? The Lorimer dataset will be published one day when it is 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 prepared to our satisfaction. The handwritten text recognition models that, um, that Mo talked about will, are, will be published so that others can benefit from that kind of groundwork, that ground research that we've been doing. 
Um, and I think also, um, if I can point to one thing that I've been doing recently, um, is which has nothing to do with what you've done today, but is connected in some ways. So where Nora was talking in the last slide about using um, bodies of material um, from uh, the Kuwait history uh, website in order to do something like search for terms or look for patterns of a recurrence of certain words uh, in those Arabic documents, which would be created using the know-how that Mo has been working on uh, for some time now. I've been doing the same thing, um, working on, on British records and doing a similar kind of, uh, a similar kind of work, uh, working on what are called word vector models, thinking about what words tend to occur together uh, in a, a diplomatic correspondence. And so because I actually had one of these models available, I was able to, in the process of a few weeks, create a small corpus, bring together uh, sources uh, from the Qatar Digital Library, about 800,000 words, which is not an insignificant amount of words, um, and to uh, start looking at the kinds of words which occur in the context of uh, the uh, debates around slavery in the 1850s. So, um, but that open scholarship also means sharing the outputs as we go. And I think this is a really important difference between, I'd say, sort of traditional scholarly uh, inquiry and open digital scholarship. It's so it's it really, if I can just end it uh, with this, it's not just that we're building the plane as we fly it, but we're also publishing the plans for that plane so that other people can actually uh, come and join in on the effort. So with that, I'm gonna thank you. Uh, I look forward to the questions uh, today uh, after the presentation, and I'm gonna pass it back to Nora. We don't hear you. I think you're no, I think you're muted. Sorry, here I am. Um, I'm just thanking you for joining us in the middle of the night. We really appreciate it and we really appreciate those wonderful comments. Um, so we do have some participants in the webinar and we also have participants in the room. So what I'm gonna try to do is um, see if there are questions in the room and then also open up the tab where I can hopefully see if there are um, uh, questions in the webinar. I'm not, not a webinar expert, so I might uh, ask somebody for help at some point, but I think that there's a way participants in the webinar, if you raise your hand, I'll be able to see that you're raising your hand and um, that's where I should yeah, we go. Have the, we have the Q and A tab. Yeah, I got I it. There are no open questions currently, but yes, you're welcome so, to put any questions. So you're welcome you to put questions there. into the Q and A tab. I think we have to do it that way because we're in webinar mode. I don't think anybody will be able to actually raise their hand. I misspoke. But are there questions in the room? First of all, we do have a small audience here. Go ahead, Hassan. Um, first of all, I just you just talk about that part of the experience, like if you guys think about doing this, you know, realize you need hands on the table. Uh, you also like think of like a project or like work in like both rooms. Um so David, can you hear? Did you hear any of that? Okay, so I'm just going to repeat it. We were worried this would happen. I um, Hassan is asking about the process of creating the Lorimer data with uh, extensive undergraduate assistance, which is something I kind of skimmed over. What were the logistics of that? How did we find people? How did we create the team? And how did we pay for it? Um, and this is uh, something I kind of skimmed over in the presentation. I usually talk about it a little more because it's also actually one of the reasons that we ended up choosing Lorimer in the first place was this issue of Trump, one of the, so I basically got into digital humanities through Open Golf, through this project. I didn't know anything about it before, but one of the things that really attracted me is this sort of very um, uh, organic combination of pedagogy and research. It's projects usually that are involving undergraduates and graduate students in producing research outputs along with faculty in a way that's very different from the normal way that we operate in disciplines like history, which is sitting in a room and working on our own and then sometimes having like research assistants that work on little parts of the project but are not really um, brought into decision making, brought, you know, not presenting work with us like we have today, not necessarily, you know, working throughout the steps of the project. So I really liked the idea of bringing um, 
having that be more of a holistic and inclusive and you know working together uh, process. When we were starting the project, David and I, you know, started working together because we were both at NYU Abu Dhabi, which is an English medium university in Abu Dhabi. It's a, um, it's you know, connected to NYU in New York, and we. Uh, one of the reasons for working with an English text is because the common language among students there was English, is English. And so basically there's a model there that's somewhat similar and somewhat different to what goes on at Stanford, where it's, it's different in the sense that it's a smaller community and you can just put out um, job descriptions to the entire undergraduate community as faculty, and they would apply to work on this project with us. And once they applied, we would sit down with them and tell them about the annotation and, and introduce them to the workflow, which changed over time, which is part of the reason that the data is so complicated, right? Because in the beginning, it sort of worked one way, and by the end, it worked a different way. Um, and they would work on it similar to how Hassan is, is working on another project with me, you know, 10, 12 hours a week, sometimes less, sometimes more, um, working through the annotation fairly independently, right? We would come together for like meetings, maybe once a week, once every couple of weeks, but most of the work was was independent, which also meant that it continued and in some ways like mushroomed during the pandemic. The pandemic was actually really good for this project because it was so organic to kind of move into Zoom um, because we had been doing so much sort of separate and together work anyway, that it wasn't that awkward to move it into a virtual space. At NYU Abu Dhabi, faculty have research budgets similar to what they have at Stanford. So that is mainly how we funded this. Um, we actually recently received a humanities seed grant here at Stanford. So now we have some institutional funding for the project, but it's mainly been like faculty research budgets. Um, yeah, that, that have been funding it. It's not, I mean, it hasn't entailed like really large amounts of money. It's been, you know, working with students who are very much working on part-time. NYU Abu Dhabi has a program um, where we were able to hire uh, immediate postgraduate students, like graduating seniors for full-time summer work. Um, we did that for two summers and that was very productive. Students got a lot done when they were working on it 40 hours a week. And that's funded through the institution, right? Like they basically, um, uh, let fa faculty members who are willing to mentor students can can get um, student uh, student work in that way. Similar, I mean, it's it's the structure is is not that different from what goes on here through SESTA or through other um, through other Stanford institutions. Is that helpful? I think for me, the most the most challenging part of it. I mean, I've, I feel like what I've learned the most about is partly golf history and partly project management. Right, learning how to create a workflow that. Um, will be sort of standard enough and shared enough and everybody will be on board with enough that we come out with something that is like potentially publishable is actually very, very difficult because we had students working on, you know, they would come in for a semester and then go off and do other things. It's like this very transient population of, of students working on it. But also, like I said, the project changed over time. So we sort of modified constantly how we were creating um, better data, i.e. data that was more, you know, that we felt was more actually um, uh, connected to the text. And so, you know, I can look at data that was created in the beginning of the project and feel like it's it's not as high quality as what happened at the end. And that's where the work that Rhea is doing coming comes in, like cleaning it, going through each place and making sure it's right and making sure it's verified. Um, but, but yeah, I think it, it's, uh, it's, I, I like the part where we can kind of bring a lot of people into a multi-headed digital project that now has a head in Palo Alto and a head in Abu Dhabi and a head in Cambridge. And there's really a lot of people working on it in different spaces, but it does make the coordination like an ongoing animal. David, do you want to speak to that at all? To the ongoing oh. animal. Sorry? <laughs> do we tally hours? Have we tallied the hours? Um, I think we, I think that what we said was that we had, we've had about, if you go to the project website, which I put into the, uh, into the chat and response um, to Thank the question, you. there's actually a tab called team. Uh, and you can see um, the different people who've been working on this project over time. Now we have not listed the hours that people have worked there. There's really, it's just listed at just a, a basic um, um, set of, um, a set of names. But I think, I guess I would say, I mean, when when I was working with people in a given semester, one of the things that it, uh, a student at NYU Abu Dhabi cannot 
surpass is this limit of 15 hours a week. In fact, people were never working 15 hours a week. People were working somewhere probably between five and 10 hours a week. And so if you take X number of students times uh, a few uh, toward, you know, six semesters or so uh, times five hours, you might get some kind of a, a number um, that makes sense. But again, I, I would say that not all that time was actually spent on working on the collection of data. Some of it's spent on learning the workflow, uh, perfecting the workflow. I think that one of the things that Nora and I realized as we went along was that we can have in our mind a really clear notion of the way that the work would get done from beginning to end. And yet that wasn't always the, the, the relationship between what was in our mind or what we even put on paper and the kind of work that students was doing was, was, not, was not a one-to-one -one perfect relationship. And so one of the things that we ended up doing was sort of giving over um, some of the agency in that process to documenting the workflow mm -hmm. to students themselves. So students began creating uh, instructional videos, uh, creating documentation. I know that Mo has done that. Uh, we have other students who've done that. And it's been really, really powerful in terms of having the processes of digital scholarship be in the words um, of the students themselves. So I'll stop there. Um, Mo or Ria, do you want to say anything about that from the student perspective? I don't know if Ria went through like the, a lot of the student, she's like the latest, most recent student to come on to the annotating process. So went through a lot of the, the student tutorial um, stuff. I'm gonna try to Mo move the screen or you could come up, yeah. We're a little awkward. Should we get one by one or just? No, yeah, okay. whatever. Um, so yeah, uh, I think for me, it was like really nice that I mean, like David was just saying, a lot of the things that we got to do, we got to like kind of immerse ourselves fully. And I feel like a lot of times when it comes to like research projects that incorporate undergrads, the undergrads do a lot of like the like the, the, the boring work, which is yes, that's part of what we do, but it's also like a lot of learning things, like becoming experts in things that you never would become an expert in otherwise, which is really cool. Like transcribus, for example, like two years ago, I never would have thought that I'd know how to use transcribus this well. And yet, like a few months ago, I was like leading a tutorial on transcribus and how to use transcribus. So I think the fact that there's so much agency and there's so much of like let, allowing us to kind of like figure out what to do and not like really imposing this like strict um, workflow that we have to follow for one has been really good for us. But I think also like for the project, um, just having these like different opinions of like, like one example is we were working with this one um, Taya handwritten text. And for some reason, transcribers could never like recognize where the lines were, even though it was supposed to. And so I just kind of like suggested it to just transform it to black and white and suddenly it worked. And that was one thing that like wouldn't have happened if there was like, oh, we had to like follow this strict workflow, just like putting it straight into like transcribers and letting transcribers do its thing. So yeah, I think in that sense, like outside of just like being nice for us undergrads to have like that agency as undergrads, it's also good for the project because like it allows us to like feel comfortable going out there and being like, oh, what if we try this? What if we try that? So. Yeah, I think it was, I think it's great. Do you want to? <laughs> Nora, we have a question from the chat from Lisa yeah, Blade. I, saw, I just want to give Rhea a chance to, to answer about the student perspective and then I'll read Lisa, Lisa, Lisa's, Lisa's question out. Um, yes, yeah, so as Nora said, very similar for me is that I was, because I think I'm like the newest addition to the project, so it's definitely a learning curve. And we spent a lot of the first few weeks just trying to kind of do the VLOOKUPs and like figure out small technicalities. And that definitely ended up taking a lot more time than the annotate than we were hoping would otherwise go into the annotations. But then even with that, I think discussing how that experience was and like the issues that we were facing, I think for the future that would help just make it all go quicker. And then often whenever like small technical issues came up, such as like would that would something be classified as a populated place or an administrative division, which came up a lot for Ajman. We spoke with kind of Everett, who's also, who worked on it. I think he was one of the seniors, the graduating seniors um, at NYU had worked on it the previous summer. So just having all everyone kind of pull in their ideas and like collaborating on that's been really helpful for me to also like learn and for us undergrads to do that, but then also for the project to just in the future like learn from that experience and have a better workflow. Thank you, Ria. Um, 
I'm going to read out um, Lisa's question. Um, Lisa Blades is the um, director of the Abbasi program. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. Um, Lisa says, fantastic presentation. What are the main research questions that you're hoping to tackle with the data collection? You mentioned some updated understandings of sovereignty. Are there other concepts of interest? And do you have plans for how to analyze the data once it is collected? Will you be using topic modeling for text? So I spent a lot of time in the first couple of years of this project having anxiety about what exactly the research questions were. And at one point, David and I sat down and decided that this was not exactly, this was not something that we were going to keep calling a project. We were going to start calling it a research group. Why? Because, and that sort of liberated me to start thinking about what I'm doing in this project in very close terms to what I actually have been studying, which is sovereignty and bureaucracy and different, you know, forms of administration across the across the Eastern Mediterranean and the Arabian Peninsula. I had think I had been very reluctant to do that because this is supposed to be this collaborative process where we're working together um, to, to think about new ways to approach texts, right? And because of that, I hadn't ever wanted to sort of hegemonically come in and make it all about my own research questions. What I came to realize is that we can all be sort of working on different research questions, some of which are shared and some of which aren't. So David has a whole nother project that we didn't talk about called Abu Dhabi Calling, which is, I mean, David has a few other projects that we didn't talk about, but one of them is Abu Dhabi Calling, um, which is analyzing uh, phone books from the late 20th century um, produced in Abu Dhabi and analyzing what they can tell us about um, the human geography of the city and you know many many different research questions but that can come together around a regional interest and around a shared interest in digital methods right and so that has been a really important step for me in understanding what it is that we're doing because I can kind of mobilize my own research questions you know we're also working on a, um, a, a research article for the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association where we're looking at um, different forms of mapping in the Arabian Peninsula and Iraq, um, especially around Ottomans, around Ottoman modes of mapping, um, you know, with a couple of other people uh, who are interested in these kinds of methods and interested in these kinds of texts. So they can sometimes come together for co-authoring, but I think it was important for me to recognize that they don't necessarily have to, and that we can um, sort of, you know, work on this, uh, work on this in whatever whatever mode makes the most sense for our own research methods. But a lot of it is learning about is learning the methods themselves, and also. Um, kind of creating a repository almost for these texts and for the data that's created for them that other people could then come and use. Um, I'm going to, I want to pass it to David to see what he thinks about that and also answer the question about topic modeling because he knows a lot more about topic modeling than I do. Thanks. Thank you for the question, Lisa. I appreciate it. Um, I, so a couple things that I would say, so connect, I, I have just being in the orbit um, of Nora, I have picked up on this question of sovereignty, obviously, and thinking about um, sovereignties uh, in the region. And of course, one of the things, so one of the things that's interested me that has become, as I've started making a, a, a few um, um, uh, data sets uh, derived from the Lorimer materials, uh, one is of weapons. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of conversation about where weapons are moving, um, where they're uh, being counted. Um, and this is from the British perspective. Um, and so what's interesting to me is that is how a source like this, which we look at as something which sits on the shelf, almost like an encyclopedia that in X number of volumes, um, is actually uh, can be read in a way, can be interpreted in a way as the kinds of knowledge that uh, the colonial enterprise was actually collecting. Right, and so when we do something like mapping, um, we end up not finding out everything which might be known. If you remember the camel map, for example, there's a lot of camels being counted in Oman, right? And I think that that is by virtue of the fact that the they were very interested in agriculture in Oman, as opposed to agriculture in other spaces. There's certainly agriculture in plenty of places uh, in the region, which is not which are not documented here. So weapons has has become interesting, um, uh, and that's in particular uh, in relationship to this uh, project with the Turkish material that Nora was mentioning. Um, I also am working on currencies and uh, currencies as a proxy for uh, transactions. And so 
thinking about what kinds of materials are being um, are, and what kinds of, uh, of, of um, currency is being um, traded in the region or what its relative value is in different places. And we get a very similar picture um, to what we, we see about weapons, which is that a lot of discussion of the rupee being very important and imp important as a, as a trading currency in certain regions, whereas the sterling um, pops up in other places. And so it's, it's a, it's, it's, we, we, we imagine again that this is encyclopedic knowledge. And I guess in some kind of an old sense, this is encyclopedic knowledge, but it's not totalizing knowledge, right? And so I think looking at what is what are the strengths and weaknesses or the, or the, 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 the places where sources speak and where they don't speak has been a very, very interesting question. I would say the same thing about environmental data. Um, we had a student come last last uh, summer and work on the camel map, uh, created the camel map. But right next to the camel map would be a goat map, a sheep map, a horse map, uh, maps of crops, et cetera. And I think that this kind of granular collection of data is precisely the kind of, is the way that we can begin to nuance um, some of the, the larger arguments uh, in the field about the region. Um, I guess the uh, on the question of topic modeling, incidentally, we did have a student from Stanford um, come and do a little bit of not topic modeling, but what's called TFIDF analysis. So a similar process of looking at the distinctiveness of words in particular um, portions of the text. I think we'll, we're going to continue with that um, uh, in the future when someone else comes along who wants to work on that. Topic modeling is most certainly uh, an, an effective approach. Topic modeling, we have to be kind of careful because there's there are there are modes of doing topic modeling or any kind of textual analysis across the languages. But the dominant language that we have here in terms of numbers of words is going to be um, Lorimer, the English source. So we're gonna have to think about some probably some mixed method ways of, of imagining that, but certainly topic modeling. And as I mentioned, word vectors, uh, word vectors, um, not from Lorimer, but from this body of diplomatic uh, materials uh, and diplomatic correspondence, which comes from uh, Bouchier. And so what I'm actually interested in that is I picked specifically um, a corpus that talks about um, debates about the slave trade and also debates about piracy um, in, and these are somewhat, somewhat close, uh, temporally speaking, and I'm interested in, 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 in trying those methods out, to be perfectly honest with you, just to learn them myself for the first time, the word vectors, uh, and then to see uh, how we might actually apply them um, to the specific corpus. So thank you very much for the question. Are there more questions in the room? We have another question. Go ahead, um, Emily, right? Yeah. Um, I have a question about why there is a national effort in this area, especially since I Um, I don't know if the people in the uh, Zoom were able to hear the question, so I'm just gonna repeat it. Emily is asking why there's no national library in this region, especially since, um, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean had uh, a strong literary tradition. So this is part of what I was trying to talk about um, in the beginning about the archival landscape in the Gulf. There's a wonderful new book that I can recommend published by Stanford University Press, which we will be um, uh, spotlighting in the third uh, event in this series on May 17th called Archive Wars by a scholar named Rosie Bashir. That's about um, the situation with the state archive in Saudi Arabia that gives a very good overview that I think is actually quite applicable to other Gulf countries as well. Um, although there hasn't been that like level of study to my knowledge of like what's happened with the archives in the other um, in the other countries, but they've tended to there are state archives, they haven't always been particularly easy to access or to access the materials inside them, but they've also tended to do versions of what the Qatar Digital Library did, which is collect material from other imperial archives worldwide about the Gulf, right, which is useful, but they haven't done as much sort of collecting and making available of local connect collections, sometimes because um, what became very clear in Rosie Bashir's work that the people living there didn't want to give up the materials to a state archive because they didn't think that it was necessarily going to become publicly available in that way. They thought it might, you know, not become not available, basically. And this has been an issue, honestly. I mean, I actually think it's a global issue with archives, right? Like 
this act of, of giving up um, material because then it becomes the domain of the archive and the archive gets to choose what, what is available and what isn't and also how it's presented to the public. So I don't think it's specific to this region at all. What is a little bit specific is that this national archiving, I mean, these are as nation states, very recent, right? So these are, um, the Gulf states are, you know, post uh, 1970s. And so this national archiving project is relatively new and doesn't have the same kind of state connection, connected tradition um, that you find say, you know, with the, in the British library, for example, but it's not, um, you know, I don't think the issues with archives and access to archives and how archives access material are, are exceptional. If that, if that makes sense. So there are archives, they just haven't, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is look for these materials that aren't necessarily as, um, as highlighted, that don't come from um, external imperial, imperial sources. But I think also, you know, the, the QDL is a really good example. Like there's so much material in the Qatar Digital Library. It's just all very much British perspective material. And that is the perspective that's really dominated the histories of the 19th and 20th century Gulf. So when I was talking about um, the maps at the end of Saudi Arabia, it's like, you know, those, um, that sort of confluence between the British and the Saudi perspective of 19th century Arabian Peninsular history is why when you Google it, that's what comes up, right? Like that's kind of a very pretty dominant um, version of, of Gulf history that comes out of the wide availability of those sources. Um, David, do you wanna say something about that I guess the only thing that I would say is that what that what I again is just to repeat a little bit what I was saying about this idea of digital scholarship kind of turning to the National Library or digital scholarship coming about in the concept of the National Library right if we look around the globe uh, it is often national libraries because they have access to materials because they've been working on digitizing them and they probably also have the know-how of things like people who work in collections development, people who work in metadata, and people who work in informatics, et cetera. There, there tends to be, that locus tends to be there. And I think the, the one place where we've really seen that emerge very, very um, uh, centrally and openly would be in Qatar. Um, but there are plenty of other cultural foundations. And I think this is actually one of the new and interesting um, horizons um, in the Gulf is as that, as, as the archival turn takes place, um, as people begin to think differently about archives, and in particular in a landscape where there's been a kind of a, a ground um, up or a, a you know, a, um, uh, not a top down, but a bottoms up kind of approach um, to archiving, we find lots of community archiving, lots of people who have taken on things like family archiving or locality archiving. And this not just in UAE or Qatar, but in other places, particularly in Kuwait um, and Bahrain, that what you'll see is that I think that may change, right? The, the, the approach to archives and what one does with them. And you know, it's, a, it's, it's also, to be perfectly honest, a, a global phenomenon to start thinking about what's called digital glam right? Galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, that sector has everywhere in the world started to build little digital scholarship units inside of them. And so we don't really know actually um, where, when that's going to arrive to the region or when it was, but my guess is it's pretty soon actually um, that people are going to start imagining the power of unlocking certain portions of those archives um, for purposes that um, that align with the uh, cultural institutions mandates. Um, I'm gonna um, go to a question in the Zoom because I think it might be something that that um, uh, especially Mo and maybe also Ria, actually maybe both of you can can also speak to, and that's from. Um, Professor Samar Sabar, how did this research group and the projects within it change your relationship to language or languages in the Gulf? And I've been sitting here thinking for a minute about, about that um, because I definitely think it has, but it's kind of a, a hard thing to articulate or it's not one that I've thought about um, that much. So uh, Mo and I have spent quite a bit of time transcribing Arabic texts through um, towards creating this automatic um, handwritten transcription uh, model and Arabic transcription model. And 
we, I mean, we've had like varying levels of challenge with the texts involved. One of the ones that we've worked on a lot um, is actually in one of these private, uh, privately funded national collections in the UAE. It's in Dubai. It's a collection of um, merchant correspondence. And what became very apparent to both of us very quickly is that um, the language in the text was very hybrid. Um, it's a uh, Sort it's early 20th century, um, somewhat formal Arabic, but also with a lot of uh, inflections that are sort of Gulf dialect, but also could be connected to um, you know to to other linguistic traditions, right? To Persian, to um, other South Asian languages, and so we. How to, I mean, it's been very difficult actually transcribing this text. We feel like we need people with more linguistic abilities, possibly Gulf-based linguistic abilities. Both Mo and I, our, our Arabic is, is very much based in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so it's, um, yeah, it's been just, that has been linguistically, I would say challenging, but also eye-opening to how, to that sort of hybridity that comes through in a textual tradition as well, right? And I think Mo was talking about um, the kind of dialect you get in handwritten texts and how that poses problems to a model that's trying to do things automatically. Um, uh, Hassan, who's in the audience, and I are also working on a similar HTR model with Arabic court records, which should be much more formulaic, these um, handwritten court records also from the early 20th century. And yet we find constantly that there's um, colloquialisms brought into them, that there's, you know, these sort of uh, things that we find grammatically strange. And I'm always, you know, I've had this conversation with him where I feel like we need a broader history of the Arabic language, right? And this becomes very clear when you're trying, you know, from the modern standard Arabic and, and its deviations, even in the 19th and 20th centuries. And that becomes very clear when you're actually trying to transcribe for a model, <laughs> meaning like for a machine learning, you know, AI model where you know that you want it to be very close, what you're transcribing should be very close to what's in the image. Um, and, and it's sort of on the same order as what I was trying to talk about with the, with the administrative divisions, that it's the kind of thing that you don't really notice until you get into it. Um, but I want to, um, um, I want to give um, Mo and, and Rhea, if they have any any thoughts about this, and David um, a chance to 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 talk. So I'm going to move out of the way. And, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think just one thing for me is anyone who's kind of worked with Arabic or even speaks Arabic knows how different Arabic is based on like different dialects. And so for me going into this, I learned Arabic in Lebanon, which is fairly similar, I'd say to Gulf Arabic, but like not similar to the, to the point where I was understanding everything as I was reading it. Um, and I think one thing that I noticed was, I mean, most people know that Arabic varies based on different dialects and even like different words, different pronunciations vary based on dialect. But I think one thing that we noticed was that words were changing based on um, and this might be because we were working with like letters a lot, but the words were changing based on who the letters were addressed to. And so, for example, if you had a letter addressed to like an Ottoman leader, there were certain like Ottoman words drawn from like uh, Ottoman Turkish. And then if you saw one with like a British leader, you'd have um, like transliterations of like English words that are written in Arabic. And so I think that was one thing that was really interesting is that even knowing how variable Arabic is, it's surprising to see how variable it is when it comes to like those handwritten texts that aren't um, I guess standardized, it, it, it really varies based on who you're talking to and you're writing to. And I thought that was something that for me personally was very interesting to kind of like look at and discover. Yeah. Any thoughts on English, Rhea? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I think I can just echo what Mo said about transliterations, because I think in even Larma, there's a lot of like Dubai will be Dubai or like they're just variations of the spellings. And I guess that's also something where it's not too much of a hassle, but it's just like, oh, that's what it meant. But unfortunately for me, I can, I can like read Arabic, but I don't understand it. Which is quite embarrassing. I've been growing up there, but um, it's been at least useful to kind of know the text because often when putting it into the um, into like geo names or into ANCOL for any of the programs we use, it won't always detect the full English one or that tend to be problems. So then being able to type out in Arabic has helped a couple of times, but I unfortunately can't speak much to the linguistics of the region. Thank you, Ria. Go ahead, David. 
Thank you for the question, Sam. It's a really interesting one. I appreciate it. I just gave a paper in Uppsala in Sweden uh, at the Digital Humanities Nordic Group about a process called named entity recognition. So one of the things that we had um, in the in the research group uh, last summer uh, was some pretty intense computational work um, using different versions, different outputs, um, uh, particularly working with the English outputs, um, both from Lorimer, um, which is highly standardized and was standardized as a part of making it into a critical edition, but then the other um, uh, outputs uh, that came from the handwritten materials um, of from the diplomatic correspondence. And so that was a very different kind of a material. Um, and the reason um, that I wanted to give a talk on this is one of the things I think that the working uh, with these particular materials in Gulf history in English, although we kind of put them into the category of colonial sources and so therefore not interesting or too dominant, uh, not uh, uh, diverse enough in terms of the larger spectrum, is that it's actually, the one thing that's important to say is that these are actually translations of lots of other languages into English, or at least half the incoming letters to the uh, the uh, to the diplomatic presence was was uh, was was written in other languages, ostensibly in Arabic and Persian. And so, what you have then is you have a body of materials in which many many different people um, were um, transliterating names, a bit like Rhea was talking about, uh, place names. Uh, people names, uh, even were inserting into the language um, objects or um, names of events or uh, places, uh, structures inside of cities, etc., using um, other uh, using um, languages other than English. And so, what you have is you have this kind of text, which is like these texts, which are full of a kind of a, a noise or a, a kind of a mouvance that's there that actually like is hard to capture. And so similar, I would concur with Mo and Rhea, both saying that in both cases, there's something special about these texts because they're not actually official texts um, that were thought about in a kind of very printed way, but there's kind of almost like levels perhaps of orality that are present inside of them. Now, why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem for digital scholarship because what, we were what I was talking about in my response, this idea that we want to be able to link one thing in one text to a similar thing in another text, if those two things are not spelled the same, um, or if those two things, one is translated and one is not, one is just tr simply transliterated, or um, one uh, is a shortened version of a name as opposed to a longer uh, version of a name, and you know how uh, names in the Muslim world can be actually quite long, depending on the context in which they're actually um, evoked, that this process of linking data in these kinds of texts based on the kind of messiness and orality um, and a sort of translingual quality of the material is super interesting to me, right? And the idea that you would take that kind of messy translingual quality of language and you would push computing to handle that is actually a very <laughs> provocative gesture, um, right? Uh, in terms of, because things like named entity recognition, which essentially means training a computer to recognize where there is a word that is a person name as opposed to a place name, is something which is mostly done on media language in any language, right? And so necessarily it's trained on something which is highly regularized, right? And what I've just basically said is that our materials are not regularized at all. In fact, they're very far from being regularized. And so if we want to think systematically, we have to somehow exist in that messy space and be able to find ways of getting around that problem to uh, serve our historical research goals. Thanks for the question. Um, we are very low on time, so if people need to leave, that's fine. Did you have a, are there more questions in the room? Did you have a question? Go ahead. Um, um, it's about the transcription process. So my question is how it was. We have transcripts we can expect to get, and we have to go back for you to find it. So if you have a text in, uh, a language that's not Arabic, they often in Turkish, do you need someone on board who can understand not just the character of the transcript, but the context as well, to be able to correct it? 
Okay, so um, I'm going to try to repeat the question. How much, when you're, when you're making a, a model in transcribus, how much do you need to know the actual context? How much do you basically need to know what is actually being said in the text versus just somebody who can transcribe the characters? How much is it about context versus how much is, is versus characters? I think, is that the question? And what about using this for Ottoman Turkish? This is a question that I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, and and wondering about, and I'm sure David has ideas about it and Mo might too, and, and I've also been um, talking about it and thinking about it in another research group with Hassan. Um, I would say the answer is we're not quite sure. Um, one, uh, there are, so there are a number, like one of the, something that I've started to see as kind of a challenge, but perhaps also an opportunity is that most of the people working in transcribers on Ottoman Turkish are actually interested in not in transcribing, so not in creating a, um, a text document in Arabic script, but actually transliterating, creating um, a, a document in um, uh, the modern Turkish alphabet, which is a variation of the Latin alphabet, right? And what that has meant is that they've created um, models that do that without the middle step of the Arabic language, the Arabic or Persio-Arabic alphabet transcription, right? Um, and that means that, well, it means a number of things, but one of the thing, one of the things it means is that we can't really take from their work and put it into our model for an Arabic. Um, transcription that spits out a text in Arabic, in Arabic, the Arabic alphabet, right? It would be easier for me to explain this if I had visuals. But um, one of the things that I've been talking about with a bunch of people is now that we're also working on, you know, another, uh, a couple of models from different, with different kinds of texts with Arabic um, handwriting is whether this very question, how well it would work on Ottoman text if we wanted to produce um, an Ottoman text that was actually in Arabic script, right? Um, and then the, and, and also the reverse. But to my knowledge, and David knows better than me because he knows the community much better, I don't think anybody has really gotten to the point of testing that yet. There are people working on, um, uh, a, a fair number of people working on it for, for Arabic, but I'm not sure that they've tested it tested those models on an Arab, on an Ottoman Turkish text, because there just hasn't been that much interest, I would say, in transcribing Ottoman Turkish into Arabic script. Um, and this is something I've actually been thinking about a lot in the past um, few months, especially since we started working on um, this project, because there's an issue with the automatic transcription into modern Turkish beyond the computational problem. The other problem is that um, people who are you know, continuing to use Arabic script languages like people in the Arab world in Iran, that text becomes less and not more accessible to them when it's transliterated into modern Turkish, right? And so I think there's a lot of reason to make that middle step explicit, both computationally and just in terms of access to texts. But you know, there hasn't, I haven't found a critical mass of people who are worried about this, <laughs> you know, like there's, it's kind of, it's a little bit niche, but like, I think, you know, for the purposes of making, you know, Ottoman history more, the, the making Ottoman history more accessible in the post-Ottoman world that is not only in Turkey, um, I think it's a really important question. Okay. Yeah, I hope that helps. David, do you want to, do you want to jump in? We're a little over time. Yeah, so. I, I do. I'll keep it brief. I mean, one of the things that I, I appreciate this question a lot because it goes to the to the, the the general issue that's very really urgent issue in digital humanities and that of text creation, right? What we want is the creation of machine readable text. Now, how did that happen once upon a time? Well, not through very ethical means, to be perfectly honest, is that English texts were sent uh, to uh, typists uh, in South Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia, uh, who typed them, often double typed them, people who didn't even understand the texts. But what you had was a one-to-one -one correspondence between a letter and a key on a keyboard. And then these things were compared and corrected, and then they built essentially corpora out of that. Now, there are nowadays many more automated means for doing that, but this mach the machine learning method, which we're talking about, is a really difficult one in the sense that and especially when it comes to handwritten text, because what we're facing is essentially when you're looking at a handwritten page, 
a scan of a handwritten page from the past is that you're looking at an old literacy. You're looking at the way that someone managed to get down information on a page given the way that they think about the relationship between letters, spellings, abbreviations, etc. And those things can be highly content and domain specific. And so what's required when you're working with transliteration um, uh, or trans excuse me, transcription of, of materials in something like Transcribus are transcribers who are highly literate, who have historicized those literacies and those documents and who understand the, um, the, the subtleties of what's going on. And we have to kind of unfortunately undo a little bit of our let's say of our a tendency to, uh, our philological tendency to normalize into something which we understand nowadays. Uh, that's not the way that machine learning works the best. Um, I say this even though I was a, a part of the group of people who were working on uh, trans, uh, transliterating, excuse me, transcribing for the creation of, of, of modern Turkish outputs. Um, but, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a functional and, and highly literate um, set of skills that are required uh, for people who are doing transcription. I think Mo spoke to that about like not quite feeling fully literate in this kind of very specific Gulf Arabic. And of course you want to give the machine as much of that detail as possible so that the outputs are then, well, systematically faithful to the particular materials that you have. The problem though, because of course, when you switch time periods or you move between things like just with the, the thing that I talked about before about the place names is that we know even in English that the place names were being standardized over the same period for which we have an archive, right? Or supposedly they were, that's the way that the, uh, that the argument goes. So anyway, I'll stop there. Um, but just to say that the transcription is not a, um, it is not a transparent uh, and, uh, and, and, a mechanical process. Great. It's highly interpretive. Thanks for the question. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming on Zoom. Thank you, David, so much. Round of applause for David and for everybody for joining us in the middle of the night. And um, stay tuned for our other events, May 3rd and May 17th. They'll be up on the um, Abbasi program website and you'll be seeing email information about them. Um, and thanks for joining us. Have a lovely evening and morning in Abu Dhabi. Bye.